Hello and welcome back to MBV. I'm Casper and today we're going to be changing around the electrical system on the Mustang again. If you had followed any of my previous videos on the 67 Mustang's electrical system, you know that I currently have a PC-180 small battery in the car. Now, this was a test to see if the small battery would be sufficient for the Mustang, and it has been for starting the car every time I needed it to start. However, now that I have more accessories on the car, I'm starting to think it's not quite enough to be a sufficient buffer, and it was having some minor issues with the handheld unit on the Sniper EFI rebooting. So the solution to try today is to move the battery from the front of the car to the trunk. Now, I normally recommend against moving a battery to the trunk, because almost everybody does it wrong. What they're trying to do is just make it easier on themselves to stick it in the back of the car or because of weight savings or balance, they just shove it in an arbitrary location in the trunk and then they don't really consider how to properly manage the electrical signals once it's there. Now with modern cars using EFI, the EFI systems are very picky and the importance of a good ground and a good positive to the system can't be overstated. You will have some of these strangest issues with your injectors and things if you do not have good grounds and good positives. There's a reason why all of the installation instructions explicitly state, usually in bold, sometimes underlined and highlighted, that you must connect directly to the battery because grounding out to various other places will not work with these systems because of how close the tolerances are. So in order to move this battery to the trunk and not drive myself insane by knowing it's installed incorrectly, we'll be doing several things that most people may consider overkill, but are probably about the bare minimums of what you really should be doing for the installation. So to start with, let's talk about what the trunk's gonna look like. The first thing to talk about in the trunk is going to be the battery. The battery needs to be housed inside of a battery box that is sufficient to contain all of the problems a battery introduces into the interior of a car. Now, just because this is in the trunk does not mean it is truly separated from the interior of the car. Your car is not a sealed box in the passenger compartment. There is pass-through easily from the trunk to the rest of the interior that gas can permeate as well as fire. So you want your battery fairly secured. In my case, I'm going to be using a plastic battery box that has the capacity to be vented properly, and I will be mounting it off to the side of the trunk here to keep it a little bit away from where the mounting points are for the fuel tank. Now, a battery box serves both functions of protecting the battery and containing the poisonous gases the battery might give off during an overcharge, or containing an explosion should the battery end up becoming overcharged or having the polarities crossed during jump starting. Now this battery box that I'm using is a slightly more expensive box, but you can use almost anything that's a fairly good heavy plastic or even some metal battery boxes as long as you understand that you now are introducing the potential for a short directly up near the terminals. Now once I had the box selected in a location picked, I now had to determine how I was going to get the wire out of the trunk and down through the body. And I know that I do not want to run the wire directly through a hole with a grommet because as that will work in a very short term solution, it will eventually cause problems. It will chew away from the wires moving or if you bend the wires tight enough so that you can secure them to the body, you're damaging the wire by turning them at an almost 90 degree angle to secure them. Now, the solution I'm going to deploy are essentially pass-through studs. These are like a bulkhead fitting that pass through a metallic stud and insulate it with plastic so that it's separate from whatever it's moving through. In this case, I needed to cut and remove a small bracket that was in the way that was part of, I believe, the original spare tire setup. Um, I had hoped to avoid this situation because I was really sick when I was doing this process, but ultimately I was able to do it after a lot of swearing and welding and patching and replacing some rusty pieces. Once I had a good solid foundation for where the battery box would be starting, I went ahead and cut two holes for these pass-through insulated posts. And the reason there's two is because I want the ground signal to have a perfectly clean run all the way to the front of the car before it connects up with the EFI system. These EFI systems do not like any variation in voltage or ground, and you need to have as clean of a setup to the engine as possible. Now in the factory setup, 
that the Mustang had, pretty much all of the grounding went to the engine block, then grounded out through there through a grounding strap on the back of the head and a few other places through the engine mounts and stuff. In my situation, what I'm going to do is bring both the positive and the negative to the front of the car and put them into breakout plates that will allow me to carry clean signals to every piece of uh, electronics in the front of the car that wants a direct connection to the charging system. Now, once I had the floor of the trunk repaired and I had the holes cut and the box kind of placed, one of the issues I encountered is the floor of the trunk's not flat. I don't have my false floor, wood floor in here to flatten out the trunk and I want to make a new one so I didn't want to go through the hassle of bolting this through what I had on hand. So for right now, I'm bolting it just directly to the uneven floor, which is twisting the battery box slightly. So that's going to be a consideration on how I mount it to ensure that I still can flex the box back and get the lid to seal properly on top. And then later on, I'll use the same holes through the metal when I put the regular floor back in, I'll simply have a level surface to bolt it and clamp it down to so that it doesn't twist and, and fight me during the installation. Once the battery location was determined, now I can go ahead and begin figuring out my wire. So the first consideration is what kind of wire to use for the installation. Now, a lot of people will say things like, oh, it needs to be double zero gauge or this or that. That's not true. It doesn't need to be nearly that big unless you have some sort of very high draw item that's going to be connected to the same circuit. So if you were running some sort of really big pump or if you had a giant amplifier set up or multiple batteries on the other end or something, then yeah, you might need something like zero, double zero gauge wire. In most cars, zero gauge will be plenty. And in fact, you could probably get away with less than that on most older cars, unless you have increased uh, alternator output or you think you're gonna be cranking a whole lot to try to start a pretty big engine. Now in my case, I knew I was gonna probably go with zero gauge wire because I like to use zero gauge wire on a lot of different applications, so I like to have it on hand. Now, one thing to consider is that the composition of the wire matters as well. Now I have two zero gauge wires here. Both of these wires are what you will get back if you go onto Amazon and search copper welding wire zero gauge or zero gauge copper welding wire. Now I can tell you right now, besides the fact that one's black and one's red, they're not the same. This is true zero gauge copper welding wire. You can see on the end, maybe, that it's very copper looking and there's lots of tiny strands of copper. Now this is a pretty flexible cable. You can, you can bend it quite a lot. It has a good, good coating on it. This is true welding wire. It can be used on air compressors, welders, all kinds of things that you're gonna have heavy draw on. This is a great solution. It won't get very hot. It will be very durable. It's readily sourceable from most places. Um, it's just a great all around solution for a lot of different things. This is not. This, you can see on the end, is silver. This is copper coated aluminum wire. Now it is lighter. It's about as flexible. It's about the same flexibility. Um, sometimes it's not as flexible because they actually end up putting thicker coatings on the wire because this can get hot. This can get really hot. Aluminum does not transfer current as well as copper. So not being as conductive and potentially having more resistance, this can get really hot in some applications. And I generally don't like to use it both because the connectors sometimes tend to break off of it, but also the extra heat isn't really worth it for the risk of fire. This isn't bad if you need to save weight and that's a really major consideration, or if you're doing a stereo system or something that probably won't have a huge constant draw if you're just gonna be charging capacitors or something. Um, this probably isn't a terrible solution, but in general, I would prefer main copper whenever possible. So in this application, I'm going to be using the real copper welding wire, both black and red. I got both colors just because I'm a little OCD on what I have to deal with going under the car, and I will be running those all the way to the front. Now, rather than running these up the front right now, being done in the trunk, I'm gonna start at the front figure out where the end point is, then I'll know where the two ends are and I can begin to run backwards to where I already have my battery placed. So let's get started under the hood of the car by taking out the battery. With the battery removed and the bracket replaced, I can now put in my breakout panels. 
So I want a positive and a negative breakout right here at the front of the car. And these little panels I found seem to be great. They're essentially a series of studs on a nice metal plate with good insulation characteristics. And they have these nice little cover plates that are held on by nylon nuts that make it a very good solution for the general aesthetics as well as practicality. Most of my cars are not show cars. I don't, I don't have any real interest in owning a show car because I don't understand why I would want something I can't drive regularly. But driving a car regularly comes with the hazard of breaking your car regularly. So a lot of times when I'm laying out my wiring on these things, it's either temporary so that I can test it for a while before I bundle it into a harness and put connectors on it, or it's going to be something that I can service alongside the road with a couple wrenches in the middle of a pouring down rainstorm. That's what these lend themselves well to. These allow me to, uh, at spur of the moment, add or subtract things from the wiring in the front of the car with basically nothing but a small wrench. And once I have these things in place, they give me a single point of troubleshooting. I now know everything comes back to here and they'll be going down these single large wires back to the battery. Now on the positive side, I went ahead and made the position for my feed from the battery, which I want toward the back of the car. I laid them out such that I could grab all the positives that would need direct connection here, like my EFI system, my starter, my alternator, and a few other items, got them access to the positive side, and then made sure that the wiring was tucked up out of the way and just kind of generally clear of any hazards. Once I had the positive sorted out, I went ahead and put in my ground side. My ground side simply needs a connection to the battery, it needs a connection to the engine block, and then any other items that need a very good direct ground, for instance, the EFI or my Vintage Air um, digital control system, that all needs, needs direct access to the grounding plate as well. Now that I have these things in the front of the car, all I have to do is basically tidy up my wiring and I will start making my main wiring feeds from the front to the back. So I clamped on my zero gauge wire with these terminals that are used on here with my four point crimp. Now this crimp does a pretty darn good job of getting a really solid connection. And then once it's connected, I also use heat shrink tubing filled with adhesive to ensure that it's a, a moisture tight seal. I've seen people leave these unsecured and it is possible, you can, you can crimp a battery terminal on there and leave it without totally wrapping it. You will get corrosion potentially in there, but the bigger concern that I have is without the stiff adhesive lined sleeve, the ends of wires tend to be able to wiggle quite a bit and bend, and that can break off all these little individual copper wires and eventually break the connection off the wire entirely or cause some sort of short or fire. So ultimately, I wanna be a little overkill on this. Once I've got the end crimped and the shrink wrap on there, I can connect it up to the end terminal in the engine bay and then toss the wire back through the length of the car so that I can start finding where it'll have its home. Within the engine bay, I simply wanna make sure the wire is held up away from the hot exhaust, tucked to the side, and then running down the transmission tunnel. The transmission tunnel is one of the only safe-ish places on this car. If I was racing the car a lot and thought that breaking a drive line was a real risk, then I probably wouldn't come down the tunnel as closely as I am, but it's far more likely that if I run to the outboard of the car or under the floor pans, that this car will be high center going in and out of a parking lot or will run over road debris that could reach up and damage it in another location and have just as likely result of a breakdown or a fire. Running it down the transmission tunnel, my only real concern is if the transmission line or if the drive line were to break, it could take out fuel lines and power lines and anything else and potentially cause a fire. But that's also why I'm going to use a breaker to ensure that if this grounds out, it instantly pops the breaker and it's not gonna sit there arcing and causing a big problem. Once the wires are in the transmission tunnel, the bigger challenge was that I was not shipped the proper wire management brackets, so I have to use cushion clamps. And cushion clamps, while they're great for some solutions, they take up a lot of space. So I had to make some concessions on where I was gonna run my wire based on where I could get tools to. And I wanted to make sure that these were in places where I could get tools in there while the drive line was in the car and the exhaust was on the car. I wanna keep it away from both of those things, but I also want to ensure that I could work on this while the car is alongside the road if needed. 
And if it's alongside the road, I'm not going to be dropping a full exhaust system, pulling a drive line, and doing all these other things. I'm going to be trying to work on it with hand tools to the best of my ability. Now, I did find a pretty good route for this. It keeps it away from the heat, it keeps it away from the drive line, and it gets me to the back of the car. Once I came to the rear axle, I wanted to go as high and close to my stops as possible. So like the rubber stop up near the top center is a good place to go past because that will stop anything from coming up to the body of the car. So unless that gets completely crushed and obliterated, nothing should be able to come closer to the body than that point. Once I've come through the rear end and around the fuel tank, I can safely stay above the exhaust. I simply have to snug all of this down and then put it, cut it to the right length so that I can connect the terminals to the battery studs. That's the same as the front of the car, crimp a connection fitting on there, go ahead and heat shrink it, make sure it's stable. And then on the back, I also went ahead and put terminal covers on here just to ensure that it wouldn't have things able to easily access the positive terminals or to ground things out. Once I had these connections made to the back of the car, essentially the circuit was basically done. Now I just buttoned up some odds and ends. So with the battery box installation, I had drilled the holes to mount it in place and it's essentially held mostly in place by the clamping force of the bracket holding the battery to the floor. But I also wanted to make sure that the breather tube, the venting tube inside the box was epoxied in place to the box so that it couldn't accidentally be pushed out. A lot of these kits come with just a rubber grommet and they want you just to basically wedge it in place but I epoxied it in place so that it couldn't move and that I also made sure that the battery terminals, I tried out a couple different kinds to ensure that I had one that cleared the top of the box as best as it could. Then I went ahead, went back to the front of the car and verified that all my wiring was still tucked and that I hadn't caused any problems that could cause a short. And then it's time for some testing. So once I had the car put back together, the best way to test the car was a short drive and then to take it to an autocross. So here's some footage of it at the autocross. 
So as you can see from those few clips, the Mustang did great at the autocross. The tech inspectors were totally fine with the installation. They even commented that it was one of the better installations for a battery relocation that they had seen. Uh, they had no issues with most of everything else on the car, except for the fact that I did not want to remove my wheel center caps because it would look ugly, and that's a safety requirement apparently. So we came to the uh, compromise of not removing the wheel center caps and looking cool. Uh, we ran all the morning sessions. I called the day short a little bit just because I didn't want to keep pushing any oil out of my breather cap with the real high RPMs. I was afraid that it'd start to accumulate and get pushed out and make a mess. So I ran for about half the day from about, we were there from seven to one-ish in the afternoon. Other people kept running all the way into the late day and got another like seven runs, eight runs in each. But that was about enough for me to test out the car. When I got it back here, I checked it for any hot spots, rubbing, melting, anything weird, and the electrical system looks great. Ultimately, I don't see anything wrong with the system from a technical standpoint, just things that I wish I would have had time to do better or the parts to do better. If I redid it, I would definitely try to find a little bit more of a, a channeled route to run it or weld in a channel box to protect it. I would also like to use better brackets for holding it in place instead of cushion clamps, and I'll probably replace those at some future date. But ultimately, this solution works well. If you're going to do it yourself, I strongly encourage you to take the time to do it properly or as properly as you can. There's always concessions that have to be made on a car that's already assembled. You're not gonna be able to do it perfect, but the closer to perfect you can get, the less problems you'll have down the road. Just save yourself, your car, and probably whoever else buys your car in the future, and do it as well as you can the first time. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments down below. And as always, I'll see you in the next video.